It's been four years since Elizabeth Barraza was murdered. On January 25th, 2019, she was setting up a garage sale in the driveway of her Tomball home. The killer was captured on surveillance video, walking up and shooting Barraza just after her husband had left for work. The getaway car, a black Nissan truck, was also seen in the neighborhood hours before and driving back by after the murder. It's a crime her parents believe was not random, but was a well-planned out hit on their daughter. But they don't know why anyone would want her dead. We sat down with them to talk about the case and the $50,000 reward they helped raise, hoping to get someone's attention. It's hard to believe it's been four years. How are you doing? Four years. So we stay hopeful. We survive through the support of friends and family. Um, and, and faith in God. Faith in God. And we just never, ever, ever give up. That's just, I mean, getting an opportunity to do something like this is our role in the whole process is to get the word out because somebody out there knows something and that person coming forward breaks the case it's just that simple rosemary tell us about your daughter tell us about liz liz was just a such a kind person she was silly i mean she was just I don't know. She had a lot of fun in her life, but she was also so giving. And, um, you know, we joke, you know, if I would ever, you know, give her a compliment or whatever and say, you know, good job or I'm proud of you or something, she'd say, I'm perfect. And she'd laugh. <laughs> and I'd say, you're practically perfect in every way because she loved Mary Poppins. And we both laugh then, you know, so it's like she didn't take herself too seriously. I mean, there was a real fun side of her just where she could be very serious. I mean, she was very dedicated, you know, and as far as her, you know, job. And I mean, she wanted to be, a, you know, do well in her job. She wanted to be, she's responsible. And, um, you know, she just, I don't know. She just was, she just was so kind and, and full of life and, um, this is just so senseless. Bob, take us back to the beginning. What do you know about the murder? So looking back over what we've learned in the four years, I think one of the most important things we did was in January of last year, 2022, um, we decided to build a website. Um, and that website was designed to start giving out facts and the truth about the case because we were seeing so much untruthful speculation. So building that website actually forced us to really knuckle down on the details and talk with everyone and such. So we actually put together a very detailed timeline of the morning, her final morning, that was reviewed and, and blessed by the detectives. So what we learned was this was not a random thing. Um, the people that did this had it very highly planned out. They knew exactly when Sergio was going to leave for work. They knew when she'd be alone. They knew that this was maybe the only chance they'd get to get to her in this kind of environment. 6.45 in the morning in January, it's dark, it's kind of cold, um, not a lot of movement everywhere. I mean, they, they seized on the moment. And the more we've looked at it and the more we've analyzed it, the more we've become aware that, that this really was highly planned and it was extremely personal. And even down to the, um, to the fact that we now kind of understand their route into the neighborhood and their route out of the neighborhood, which was kind of a revelation. 
Um, there's been some speculation of, a, of an alternate route, and we've reviewed that and find it to be totally plausible. Um, I think that, that spending all this time putting together that website and trying to educate people and giving people a resource has been really helpful um, in making sure that, that we have that resource. And it's very, it has nice traffic. We get up between 2,500 and 4,000 fresh visitors a month to the site. And it's all organic. It's, it's just from promoting it on Facebook and, and the search media. But people are interested. And we feel like that website and the social media outreach that we focused on last year is, is hitting a whole different segment of the population that probably get most of their news off of the internet instead of off of media. And so what we've learned, I think, to sum it all up is the reason why this case is unsolved is it is so complex and there's so many parts and pieces. And that's why we really need the public's help. Somebody that's heard something, somebody that knows something to come forward. Because ultimately, if you look at it, there's $50,000 in a reward at Crime Stoppers. And we all know how safe and secure and anonymous that whole process is. So we just keep hoping by, you know, by having opportunities like this with you, that we're going to hit that person that's finally going to say, you know what, I'm going to do the right thing. Rosemary, did Liz talk to you about this trip they were planning? <laughs> she talked to everybody about it. <laughs> Um, they didn't post it on, she's smart, she didn't post anything on, you know, social Facebook or, or other social media, but, um, oh, she was, anytime Liz went anywhere, it was with a purpose, you know, and she was going to have a great time and they were going to have a great time and, um, you know, she just, she was so excited, Sergio uh, got her for Christmas a Harry Potter uh, suitcase for the trip and she had had that packed for I don't know how long and um, you know it just you couldn't help but be excited for her because she just was like she had everything planned I mean it down to I think probably the day anyway yeah. you know they uh, had went ahead and bought uh, some specialty tickets for the park where they were, you know, going to be like behind the scenes kind of thing. And um, so, I, I mean, everything was always planned with Liz. And so she enjoyed the trip, you know, all of the trips that they've gone on, but she's also enjoyed all the time planning the trips. So, yes, we did hear, you know, a lot about the plans. And and she was so excited. And... Um, and the trip was to celebrate their, their fifth five-year yes. anniversary, which yes. was two days. It was uh, it was February, February 1st. first, yeah. so just a couple of days beyond. She was going to leave on the twenty seventh to to go to Orlando with Sergio, and they, they were going to spend that have that trip. It was one of several trips that they had planned and budgeted that year because they really they loved doing it, and. She was over the moon about it. That was just like, that was her place. Disney World and, and, and uh, yeah. Universal City uh, yeah, Studios. Universal Studios. And when did she decide to have the garage sale? Um, she, she talked about it probably for a good month, you know, where she was starting to get stuff together. And, um, but I'm not exactly sure... Um, I would say, I think we probably, you know, heard about it like the week before where she's like, when, okay, I'm going to be having it. We, um, she, you know, the garage sales we always had were, were Friday and Saturday. And so that was, you know, nothing new. Um, she was going to do that. And, uh, you know, so we were going to go, um, on Friday um, she had asked us if we had anything, and we really didn't. And, uh, you know, uh, I've in the past, I had gone to the garage shows, but I'd 
come late because I'm not a morning person. And uh, I'd usually get her a coffee and come in, you know, around 10 or whatever. And, uh, but we were going to actually go early. Um, and, uh, you know, the night before, you know, Bob was unemployed at that time. And so, you know, he thought, well, you know, I, I, I really should use that time to find a job. And so we talked, we talked to her and we just said, you know, well, you know, we're not going to, you know, come that early, you know, we'll, 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 you know, I'll come over and if he can't or whatever, uh, you know, a little bit later on. And, um, you know, she was okay with that. I mean, you know, she's, you know, pretty independent and, and, um, she had surgery to help her set up. Yeah. And but you said, Bob, that she's she was also security conscious, right? Oh yes. So she had set the alarm on the house. So what she what what Liz always did when she left the house was her car was in the was in the garage. She would go out to the car, lock the door, set the alarm, and then um, she'd start her car up, lock the doors, open the garage door, and back out. You know, she just did. She she was not a chance taker. The day of the garage sale, that abundance of caution led her to set the alarm in the house on instant trigger and leave the door from the garage into the house unlocked. And I can only say that this was in case she needed a quick retreat, that she knew that she would be able, if she could get to the door and pop it open, then the alarm would instantly be going. And if somebody was trying to rob her or do something that she was uncomfortable with, she would have that that safety. And this is just Liz being Liz. Right. She had no reason that you no, know of no. to be threatened that morning. That was just part of her lifestyle, part of her characteristic. Her mother had drilled this into her from a very young age about being aware of her surroundings and being careful. And, and this is just... It's a part of who she was. She would have never not had an escape route because, frankly, she's going to be out in her garage early in the morning. It's a great neighborhood. It's, it's, it's not like the neighborhood had any issues, but she was just cautious. And, you know, she had moved her car. And I believe, although I don't know the layout, I believe she made sure she had a, a clear path from where she would normally be standing into the garage and to that back door so that if she needed to get away, she could. Had she had other garage sales before? She um, started having, of course, when she was younger, she would help me with my garage sales and she'd sell stuff. Um, and when they before they bought the house, she would come and bring stuff for garage sales at, where, at my home, at our home. And, um, but... They moved into the house, I believe it was 2017, and she, I believe this was her third garage sale uh, at this home. And like I said, it was always on a Friday and Saturday. It was different times. She would just be like, well, okay, I'm going to have a garage sale. I mean, she'd plan it, but it, it wasn't like, okay, the, you know, the fourth weekend of of January I'll have one it was never I mean she had them probably in August and I'm making up these dates because I don't know the exact dates but I mean they were different times of the year so it's this was not like a normal uh, garage sale where people would be like well, no the Barazas are having a garage sale this is this is date you know um, you know even when you know like Bob said when she would leave in the morning when she was pulling out of her garage she was looking to make sure somebody didn't sneak in to the garage. And she did that when she was going into the garage. I mean, she was just, I don't know, you know, as a parent, I think we all worry about our children and we try to prepare them as best we, as we can. And, you know, she would get so annoyed with me, she and her brother, because they'd come home from school and I'd be like, I just saw this thing on, and I'd record it and I'd make them watch it, you know, on, on kids safety. And, um, but she, she, well, I think at, at the time she would act annoyed with me, like, Oh, and really we have to do that again. Um, as she grew up, she would caution her friends in middle school and in high school and in college. She'd be like, 
don't do that, you know, <laughs> you, you know, if it's dangerous or whatever. And so, I mean, she, she really did take it to heart. And I, I know that we did everything we could to yeah. prepare her for life. And she was, I mean, she'd be driving and she'd be like, mom, somebody's been behind you for a while, you know? And so she was always watching. I mean, and, and sometimes she'd actually catch up when I wouldn't. But I mean, I don't know. It's just, she was cautious, but she wasn't afraid of people or anything. It right. wasn't, but she was always aware of her surroundings. And I think that the person that did this, they caught her off guard. She's having a garage sale. They acted like they were just a regular person coming to a garage sale. And I, I, I don't think that she was afraid until they pulled out the gun. I mean, uh, and you can obviously see she's afraid. She she's stepped startled. back, yeah. you know, and, and, and um, so I don't, she didn't have any reasons, or at least I, we're not aware of any reasons. And I don't think that she was had any reason to think that somebody was out to get her. Right. No one ever threatened her. No, there was no, not, no not that previous we're... relationship. No. In the no. deep dive that was done into her social media, her phone, her friends, everything that the uh, Michael Ritchie, Sergeant Michael Ritchie, looked into when he was in charge of the case, um, failed to turn up any real credible threat, uh, failed to turn up any dangerous behavior. She didn't go do dangerous things. She didn't go to dangerous places. She was very careful. And I think part to what Rosemary was speaking about, I think one of the other things that was a big influence on her being safe was in the year prior to them buying the home, they were burglarized in their apartment. And this was like very traumatic. It was a place where she felt very safe. It was a three-story walk-up. I mean, so, I mean, you have to be really dedicated to want to, to break into a place like that. And that had, a, that had a profound impact on her. And I think it just made her that much more cautious and aware. Mm -hmm. So this, the murder happened in 2019. Correct. They moved into the home in 2017. 2016. Mm -hmm. 2016. 2016. I have yeah. a horrible memory. They were married in 2014. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yes, five correct. years. 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how long before they were married had they been together? Nine years. They, they were together a total of nine years. They so were I, together in college. At uh, they met in 2009. Yeah, I think that's right. The, the in the fall of 2009, yeah. because that's when she moved um, transferred to Stephen off Austin. Or not Stephen F. Austin. From Stephen to Sam Houston. Houston from Stephen F. Austin. So yeah. they met at Sam Houston. They met Correct. at Sam Houston. Correct. And it was the first semester, so she, and she was a sophomore. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, you know, nine to ten years. And Do you remember when she called you and, and said that she had met someone? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I, do, I do remember when she brought him by. And that was, I mean, she... All we ever wanted was for her to be happy, and he absolutely did that. He he made her so happy, and together, it was really the the thing that I've heard said by more than one person is that they were two wonderful people, and when they were together, they were so much better, so much more amazing. They 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 really complemented each other and sort of magnified their their good intentions towards the world so all the charity work that they did all the the you know the I can't tell you how many times she'd call me up and she'd be so excited say oh dad there was a law enforcement officer at Starbucks and I bought his coffee this morning or um, just they were handing out water because water needed to be handed out wherever she found a chance to do something little, just a little something to help somebody, she would do it. And when the two of them were together, and when they when they when they crystallized around the five hundred first, and the opportunities that that afforded them to go to children's hospitals, to go to um, community events, to go to even 
Tell us about the 501st for people that may be listening to this interview that don't know what the 501st is. What is it? So the 501st is a worldwide organization that um, was founded by people who love Star Wars. And the founder, Albin Johnson, um, started it off simply by building stormtrooper armor and going to a movie theater for a premiere and found all these people just so excited about it so it started to spread and after a while he decided that there was something there it was a lot more than just plastic spacemen and so ultimately he started building it and growing it and they they quickly worked with Lucasfilms to get sanctioned and so becoming a member of the 501st is there's no cost involved in terms of money or dues or things like this. The cost of admission is you have to make a costume that is according to the Lucasfilm screen guidelines. So you can't throw something together out of um, stuff that you bought at Walmart. You have to build a 501st quality. You have to build a Lucasfilm's quality. And both costume. Liz and Sergio... So they started with, with Sergio. Mm -hmm. They started with Sergio, and Sergio built the the, the standard stormtrooper, and Liz became a handler, and helped where it should. Because what's really important in the five hundred first is whenever you see a helmeted character, so Darth Vader, a stormtrooper, a Tie Fighter pilot, any helmeted character, their visibility ends right about here. And so if you're in a crowd with little kids, and little kids are going to come running up to these characters, this whole area is obscured because you have limited visibility in those helmets. So the role of a handler is to do two things. Number one, keep the public safe. And number two, keep the character safe. So Liz became a handler, which meant that she got to go along, and they started planning, and she decided that she wanted to be a biker scout. So they started the process of building her Biker Scout. And when you get your costume complete, you go through a process where you have very detailed photographs taken. And they're submitted to a person in the 501st who is trained to evaluate the armor against the standards. And if it passes, you become a member. And at that point, you're issued a number. Well, actually, you get to pick your number. And you're, you've, you've fulfilled the requirements. So Sergio got in, Liz got in probably eight, nine months later. Um, it takes a long time to build these costumes. And they got to do the things they wanted to do. So that opened up the world of going down to Memorial Hermann to the oncology ward and doing Halloween or doing uh, a chemo, a bell ring. Uh, they get calls for kids that are having um, private parties where they're coming home after therapy or they're leaving to go to the hospital and the family makes a request to the 501st and if they can honor it, they do it. They bring characters in. And the thing that's wonderful about it is the 501st will use this opportunity to raise money for charity. So they can't accept money for what they do. Um, that's just, that's not allowed as it shouldn't be allowed. But what they can do is they can take donations. So one of the things that you see them do occasionally is they'll get a request from a couple that's getting married and they want to have Darth Vader, Kylo Ren, and a couple of stormtroopers there when they walk down the aisle. So they'll do that and then the bridal couple will make a donation to a, an approved charity like the Peter Mayhew Foundation or Make-A-Wish to you know, to compensate for the for the time the character spent, so that whole concept behind it of the the when when uh, Alvin started it, the the catchphrase for the five hundred first is uh, bad guys doing good, and that's his whole thing. And if you if you even look on the web and search under the five hundred first, you will see all these amazing things that were done to help children, to help sick people, to, you know, assist people in feeling better. And that's what Liz loved. 
Um, there's an event that happens every, Fe I think it's February. It's Mardi Gras. Yeah, Mardi Gras time. That's held down at Moody Gardens in Galveston. And it's called the Special Persons Ball. And they bring in all these amazing people who are special in a lot of different ways. And the 501st has been invited to this end. And one of the things that's great about that is it's a long event. So unlike some of the other things where it might only, you might only be in the hospital for an hour, this is like most of a day. And some of the greatest memories I have of Liz is her dressed up in her biker scout with Mardi Gras beads on, dancing with these little children. And you look in the video and you see them just smiling they're just the happiest they've been that's what she lived for that's what she wanted to do it just seems like liz and sergio had this picture perfect life they did they were i think very fortunate i mean they worked at it you know but um they they had the best time together i mean and they were able to do it you know, they both had good paying jobs um, and they were very responsible. They didn't spend money they didn't have, but they planned for things. And so they had numerous accounts where, okay, this money is in an account and it's for uh, the trip to Disney World. And the garage sale was to give them extra spending money? Clear the, that up for okay, us. Okay, the garage sale, it, it, this is what's so hard about this because the garage sale, she did. She wanted to raise a little bit of extra money for souvenirs and stuff. And it just, it pains me to no end because the garage sale, if she had sold everything at that garage sale, she might have made a couple hundred dollars. Knowing Liz, though, she wouldn't have. Because Liz was so, if somebody wanted something and she thought that they were excited about it and they, you know, she would sell it really cheap to them, even if, you or know. give it to them. Or, or, you know, I mean, and so, honestly, if she had been able to raise 200 that I, that would have been amazing. They had already paid for their trip. They had already paid for the airfare, the hotel. They had a, a they had money saved for souvenirs and i will tell you she told me and i will not tell you how much because i was like are you freaking kidding me <laughs> sorry um they didn't need any more money but she's like well you know there might be something else that we want to get <laughs> you know and and so it was but they they did they had they had planned several trips that year and they were paid for and they didn't use credit cards. They didn't, I mean, they didn't have, they didn't have debt. They didn't, they were just really smart about their money. And they, 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 they just didn't do things that they couldn't afford, but they saved for it and they did it. Yeah. And so it's, it just, it makes me crazy thinking that she had this garage sale because it's like, she really didn't need to. She, it, 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 it was, I, I don't really understand why she, I mean, I don't get it. But, you know, that's Liz. I didn't always understand everything. She was really smart. She, I couldn't fault her for anything, you know. Um, but it, it's like, you know, she, she did what she wanted to do, but she was responsible about it. And it's like when, hey, if you can do it. I mean, I didn't, we didn't have to worry about her doing stupid stuff. She just didn't do it. She was so responsible and so, she just amazed us. I mean, honestly, I was like going, can you teach me this? Because I, you know, I don't, it, she just, I don't know. And she had actually left that morning. A lot of people may not realize she mm -hmm. had left to go to Starbucks. Of is course. that right? right. <laughs> and Sergio was at home. She had left. Yes. And then she brought Starbucks back home. Correct. Correct. And then he leaves. Right. Correct. And he, well, he actually went and helped her set up. So they're setting up together. Right. Mm -hmm. And she had some large things. There was a treadmill and a few other large things and tables that needed to be set up. But the majority of the items were small. And 
he helped her until she had it. And then, as as he said on camera multiple times, he said, you know, goodbye, honey, I love you. Gave her a kiss, got in his work van, and so left to go to work. So you can see that all on the doorbell camera. You can't see. Well, we have not seen that. Yeah. Um, you know, we only have seen videos that has been uh, actually... Um, the camera across the street would have caught it. Caught but, it. But we have not seen that portion yeah. of it. But they've told you it's but on video. But we, 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 we know enough uh, about, uh, we knew that he, he was driving his, the, the work van. Um, and we did see on the doorbell camera, which uh, was just actually posted recently, where Liz come, is, comes back from Starbucks. Starbucks and she makes a face at the front door. <laughs> she's got Sergio standing on the other side of the door and she's like, you know, just being herself I mean so happy she went there was nothing like you know anything that that she, she didn't have a care in the world yeah. you know and how many minutes between the time when Sergio leaves and the killer shows up so in according to the timeline it is just a few moments it might be two or three minutes max and so they were waiting they, they were they were in the neighborhood they had, originally, they had originally pulled into the Goddard School at the front of the subdivision. And then for some reason, either because they, sus they expect, suspected there was a camera or there were a lot of parents coming by with kids, they left and they went down to another entrance where they pulled in. And that entrance gave them visibility on the main exit. And according to the timeline, though, the truck leaves Goddard school seconds before Sergio left Exits. the house. Yeah. So they knew it, it was could, gone. It could, it could, it, 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 it's very possible, and we don't know this for a fact, but it's very possible that Sergio, when he left the subdivision, he was directly behind the truck, but we didn't see, know. didn't think anything of it. But I mean, it's that close of a time period when they're actually leaving the subdivision. Yeah, and then they... And so that's why we, we kind of think that either they... They were waiting to see, see him, him leave, leave and got nervous be, or, for whatever reason, or they decided that he was leaving soon and they were going to get in position. We, we don't know, but it's like literally Sergio's out of the neighborhood probably less than a minute. And, and then that killer pulls up, you see the truck... You see them get out. They leave the car running. Yes. Mm -hmm. in the truck, yes. And approach Liz on the driveway. Yes. Well, they're actually, they actually start off in the grass. Just, just. Uh, they cut the, across the grass in the sidewalk. Right. Just to the, to, to, I guess, it's very, they get on her driveway very quickly, but they do cut across the grass um, on the west side of her house. Um, but, yeah, they I mean. It's, and it's it's very quick. They, they're walking up. We can tell from the uh, from the audio that the the doorbell camera was picking up, that which the, a lot of people have tried to analyze. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. We've, what can you make out? Uh, I can make out her say good morning, and um, I've listened to and looked at some of the interpretations, and one of the interpretations essentially describes the kind of conversation you would have with someone if you were going to a door if you're going to a garage sale and i have a tendency to believe a lot of what was in that because the the words that they attribute to liz are things that she would have said things like yep or sure we're sure people i say sure all the time um liz would say sure all the time so i i i get the feeling that the walk up to her was designed to not trigger, make her on high alert. And they walk up, they get in her face, and the gun comes out. And at that point, it's a matter of seconds. You do, you see her jump back. Oh, she, that's the part that... It's the, the that's, that, that and her scream are the hardest part of, of the video and, and audio. It's just... While Liz was so cautious, she was not, I don't ever remember seeing her really afraid. 
And to, when she, to see her jump back like that, yeah. I know she was really afraid. Yep. You know, and it's just... And the nature of the next very, couple of seconds. Yeah, I mean, and then hearing her scream. I mean, it's... Three shots. <laughs> and then she falls to the, she falls to the, to, to the driveway. And then the fourth shot administered, the, the, the person leans over and administered point blank right here. And... It looks like a hit. It does look like a hit. It's, I, I, it's, I think we're all convinced that it's, it's a hit. It's so professional. Um, you know, the fact that they left absolutely no physical evidence behind. They used a revolver. Um, Do you think they knew they would be on camera? I think they did. Because I, think they, I think they knew about the, her ring, or not ring, excuse me, Nest camera. Yeah. I think they knew about it because I think that's why they parked where they did, so it wasn't be in the shot. And I think that, um, I don't know if they knew that there was a camera across the street or I not. I think they did know, because when they drove by at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, um, and we're speculating, of course, um, I think they were, number one, trying to see what Sergio was driving, because he owned a truck that sometimes he would drive, and other times he would bring a work van home with him. And I think they wanted to see what he was driving so they'd know when he was gone. But secondarily, the way that they drove, um, I'm sure they were looking for cameras and things that were potential. As careful as they were, cameras and the Bozeman camera across the street um, was a surveillance camera. It's not a doorbell camera. So it's, it's on constantly. And I, I feel the way that they do a three-point turn and they come up behind so that the front of the truck is obscured. I, I honestly think they knew that they were going to be on camera. And then they come back by... 58 seconds house. later, uh, in the timeline, we discovered that a, one of the callers to 911 described the truck in the, in the beginning of his call. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he, in essence, described a dark Nissan truck leaving the scene. And 58 seconds in, he says on the 911 call... The truck just drove back by. And that's a really gutsy move because constables were there very quickly after. The, the uh, Precinct 4 responded very quickly. And I think that there's a very good chance that they knew that the constables were on the way. And I don't know why they drove back by. I don't know if they were changing their exit route or if somebody said, I need proof that she's down. Um, we just, at this point, we don't know. But what we do know is they were, they exited the neighborhood and according to everything we've heard, uh, the truck was lost in an area where there was no commercial camera feeds at all. And that's the last we've, we've seen of it. And now you think possibly there could be another alternate route that they took. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've on seen, the exit. Yeah, on mm -hmm. the exit, we've seen we've seen um, some speculation by some people that have really spent some time, and it looks like there's a possibility that they could have gone down a dead end cul-de-sac, and that had a driveway style curb in the cul-de-sac, and drove up onto a green belt and exited onto Kirkendall far down the road from where the police were coming in at the main entrance to Princeton Place, which if you're trying to not get that truck observed, that would be a pretty smart play. So they still made it to Kirkendall no matter which route they took. Yes. There's just a right. thought that this South would be an alternate, alternate, yep. alternate right. route. But it was, it, was, it was helpful, I think, for us to see it because... We never knew how, we were like when, okay, we knew that the truck went back and passed the house, but we never knew where. How, it, how they got out of the Where it went. Yeah. Or, and, and, and it sounds silly because it's like, there's so many things we don't know, but finding that out, you know, there, there's a video camera that, ta that shows this truck going down the, a dead end street. And, and what he's talking about with the, the, uh, the uh, uh, green belt. They don't see it return, so that's, I mean, it's only logical. It explains things. It went somewhere. 
Yes, and and so it explains things to us. And for for me, at least, I feel like you know every little piece of information that I get that is it is real information, not because there, there's a lot of stuff out speculations, and we have a lot of speculations. We appreciate that people are speculating, and you know, but we need proof. But it's just just seeing that, okay, that's how they left and that makes sense to us. It just, it's a piece of information that we didn't have before. So it's like precious. It's, it's, it just gives me some sort of peace of mind. At least I know that little bit, you know, that's new information to me. And, you know, (laughs) Unfortunately, really, all we have is speculation. There's very little... Um, oh, yeah, beyond the facts of that day. Right. There's nothing. I mean, there's no real information. And even then, it you know, we weren't told a lot. And there's errors in uh, the, the uh, Precinct 4 uh, report. There are some errors in there. And um, preliminary information, yes, yes, absolutely. You know, sure. I mean, and you know, um, the we want people to have the facts, and that's why we did this as well well as we know. And one of the things that has come out and that bothers us is that she was only hit three times Um, because there is. In the video, the doorbell camera, you can see where there's a puff of smoke or dust well, or whatever. The, where the bullet hits but the brick, the, hits and then for, ricochets up and okay. hits the top of the house. Okay, and so, and unfortunately, in the reports, a I don't know if there's in, in the reports, there's a statement made by an emergency response person that she was shot three times and. Um, this was in the heat of a really, really, really hectic attempt to save her life. And in fact, that has been seized on by some people to say that this couldn't have been professional because you, you wouldn't miss somebody at that point blank range. And in fact, she was shot four times. We confirmed it with the detectives in the case. It, it lines up with what we saw in the hospital. Um, and, and ultimately what, what really matters to us is I don't want to see the propagation of speculation that's that's untrue that's not based on facts and that's why her website is so important that's why like we will not engage in the the conversation in the social media spaces because it's it's just too wide open we don't want to expose ourselves to it but we want to give those people something to really talk about and so that's why we we we've done it and we've learned some things from it you know the speculation about um uh, an alternate route out of the neighborhood it it fits it makes sense it kind of was helpful to us we actually drove it and then i got out and walked the uh the, the supposed path i wanted to make sure that there wasn't a big ditch that would have prevented it and I'll be honest, when I walked it, I looked in all of the, the, the trees that are growing there and everything, because I thought to myself, what if I was to come on a piece of physical evidence that was discarded the day of the murder, even though this was three and a half years later, it could just be sitting there. And there are some trees that have grown up in the area, and, and this area is used by, like, you see, you see the ATV tracks and things like that. I actually walked it and, and looked so carefully. I took my time. And unfortunately, I didn't find anything that, that you know, was even remotely connected. Who but, called you all that morning? We got a call from um, the alarm company, her alarm company. And, um, I mean, we were both in bed sleeping. It was pretty early. And um, the phone rang, and it was the alarm company, and... They said her alarm had gone off, and and uh, now why did the alarm go off? Because did anyone enter the, the house? The, the police, police went in to clear and, the entry. house. And see, and what what's bad is 
the police, and, and I don't mean bad like, oh, but we weren't notified when it happened because they didn't enter her house for like 20 minutes yeah. to clear it. And so we get a call, we, you know, and, and I picked up the phone and because I'm on her contact, you know, uh, list. And um, they, they said that her alarm had gone off and they couldn't reach her. And they couldn't reach her. And they're like going, should we contact the police? And I'm still half asleep, but I'm like going, I, and you know, I don't want police coming out if it's nothing, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, and it's your, your, and I'm like, when I don't know, I said, look, I, 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 I call, yes, go, yes, call the police, have the police come out. Um, it only took me a few seconds, but I just remember being like kind of in a panic, like, oh, should, should see if they call the police? I mean, you know, um, it, it, you know, and we just jumped up out of bed and we're like going, okay, we try, I, we tried call, calling her and she didn't pick up. And, and, um, I mean, and again, it was really quick. We were out of this house in, in a matter of a couple minutes. I mean, yeah. we just threw on clothes basically. And you went there? You and we went to her, her house. house. And um, on the way there, Sergio had called us and said that he can see po could see police tape, um, but he didn't know if it was in front of if it was for his house or from his or, doorbell or, cam for or the or the neighbors, and um, that he tried to call Liz and she didn't answer. And I said, well, yeah. And, and, uh, we just, we, we went and, you know, in the begin in the front of her subdivision is where they life flight picked her up and they had already left, but, um, they had just left. The ambulance was still there. There were, it's a fire engine there and, and some, I don't know, cop cars and stuff at the, at the landing site. And, I, I, we we were like going, well, maybe it's not her because yeah. it's like a block away from her, her house. And so we actually stopped the, the ambulance and I said, you know, are, are you involved in, in it? I mean, I'm like, I don't even know exactly what I said, but it was kind of like thinking that, well, maybe it was he, that this happened there and not at her house. And this was all some kind of mistake. And they were like, when well, you just need to go on down to the, her house. And um, they wouldn't obviously say anything to us. And when we got down there, the police were there. We saw the tape and everything, and they talked to us and, and everything. And we identified ourselves. You know, so. Um, and they uh, they kept us behind the tape. They didn't they didn't let us proceed. I don't recall seeing really anything other than a very large police presence mm -hmm. and lots of people already involved in preserving the crime scene. So at this point, she'd been transported. So the next step in that whole thing is preserve what's there. And they asked us some questions. Mm -hmm. They took us separately and asked us questions. And and, um, and we stayed there until Sergio got there. And we didn't, you know, when we found out that they were life, that she was life flighted, I think I, I hate to say that, but I actually kind of resigned myself that she was gone because I just kept thinking they don't just call life flight for something. And they did tell us that she had been shot and all that, so we knew that. And we didn't want to leave Sergio by himself. By himself. Um, he wasn't there yet. He arrived, I don't know, I think it was like 10 minutes after we had gotten there. and But we didn't want to leave because, quite frankly, we a lot, watch a lot of TV drama shows. And you, we, you, it is typically the husband. And... We knew we, that they'd be all over him. We wanted to, to, and rightfully so. I mean, we understand that, and rightfully so. We really wanted just, we, I think it was because we knew that that's what Liz would want us to do. Yeah. And so when he got there, they did let him go across, you know, past the, the, the tape, the police tape. But um, 
and they kept us kind of away, but they would let us talk, you know, but we got on the phone and we're trying to get his family there so we could leave because we didn't want to just leave him by himself. Did you all assume that it was a robbery at first? I mean, when you no, hear your daughter never, is shot, did you think, never, you know what, why was never, she shot? It never, I think that, it, for me anyway, I know, I never thought about robbery. Mm. I did, I just, I couldn't understand. You I, didn't know what to I, expect. I, I, I'm like going, it, it, it's, I couldn't, I In couldn't imagine mind, any reason or anything for anything. Our minds didn't go there. Our minds went to, why was my daughter flown out of here in a helicopter? Why? I mean, and it, it was a large police presence. Precinct 4 responded in mass to this. And then sheriff's office started coming in as well. And we just... I, I think we were just in shock. And I yeah. think it's, it's just you're kind of... So you never know how... I mean, God knows we had never even thought of anything. I, like things this. I worried about is when my kids were growing up is that they'd be taken. That was like the worst scenario that would ever happen. And I still think that's the worst that can happen. I don't know how, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how you go on when your child is missing. And I don't yeah. care if it's an adult. It's missing because then you, your mind goes all different places. Yeah. It's a different kind of constant and, worry. And so, I, I don't know. It was just kind of, I think it was just disbelief. But nothing was taken. No, nothing. I just they want people to know that. They nothing. Touched nothing. They, they touched were nothing. So careful not to leave any kind of touch evidence behind. They, that's the thing. The evidence. They didn't they, even touch Liz. No. 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 I, not that. Not. That not we, that we can see. We can camera. see, or we've heard, that we've heard. No, they have touched nothing, and it's just it's. Um, It's so hard to say it's hard to imagine. It's ridiculous because, of course, it's hard to imagine. But it's just, I, I, she did not live a dangerous lifestyle. She did not, I mean, she was just a good person. She didn't do anything. She wasn't involved in any, even questionable Yep. activity or Sergio, you know, I mean, and so it's like, what could possibly be the reason? And we still, you know, we're speculating and going, okay, what's the reason? Well, you know, maybe somebody was jealous of her. Maybe they were jealous of, of Sergio and Liz's uh, relationship. Maybe they were jealous of, you know, that they, they were able to have a nice home and, and, and go on vacations and, I mean, they were dream. They they were living a dream life. I mean, it's it's. But it's to me, it's really hard to justify the risks that were taken. Yes. To kill her for something like that, and it's 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 ultimately, even I would think, for someone that is practiced in the process of killing someone and escaping the scene and not being captured and and such um it, it's hard to imagine anything that would lead up to someone feeling like this was a necessary thing to do and they clearly felt like this was a necessary thing to do so th- that that's just what makes it so ridiculously hard and that's why we keep Every chance we get, um, you know, talking with responsible people in the media, people that we know that are going to tell the story correctly, to get the story out there because we're never going to figure this out on our own. It's going to have to come from somebody that heard something, knows something. Um, You know, the people are still out there as far as we know. And uh, this is not the perfect crime. We've had multiple um, experienced homicide detectives uh, tell us that this is a solvable crime. Um, it's not magical. There's, there's a way to solve this crime. And like we said, we feel like the sheriff's office may be closer than we know, 
and they're protecting their case, and I want them to protect their case. And if they have to withhold information from us, please do. Because at the end of the day, all we care about is that the people that did this are, are caught, successfully prosecuted, and kept from ever doing this to another family. Because I would not wish the last four years of our lives on anybody.